Katie Porter. I'm Katie Porter, and I'm running in a 49, 40. <laughs> <laughs> too many times. I'm Katie Porter. I'm running in the 45th congressional district against Republican Mimi Walters. I'm a consumer. I'm a consumer protection attorney. I'm a law professor at the University of California, Irvine, and I'm a single working mom to three great kids. by predatory lenders and big banks. I was one of the first in the country to blow the whistle on what the banks were doing before the foreclosure crisis. And my research calling out what the banks were doing was featured on the front page of the New York Times. I worked with then Senator Elizabeth Warren to help write legislation to cut down on credit card abuses. In 2012, I served at the request of then Attorney General, now Senator Kamala Harris, as the state's foreclosure prevention monitor, helping thousands and thousands of families who were facing eviction or foreclosure because of the foreclosure crisis. I had two jobs. One, the best part was to talk directly to people about what was happening in their lives and how I could help them stay in their homes. And the second part was to hold the big banks' feet to the fire and make sure they did what they promised. So that's my background and my work. Uh, my opponent, Republican Mimi Walters, is a 99% Trump voter. She was elected for the first time in 2014 and re-elected in 2016. When people ask me if she's so terrible, how did she get elected? I like to explain that she fell uphill. <laughs> this is a district that has never seen a competitive congressional campaign. That's why we haven't won it. It's not because we can't, it's because we haven't tried. So our campaign is about holding Mimi Walters accountable to the people of Orange County. Uh, Mimi Walters at every turn is selling our democracy to the highest bidder. And how is she doing that? By standing by as Betsy DeVos is auctioning off our students to shareholders. By giving big oil its wish list, like drilling off the shores of our beaches. By passing a Trump health care plan voting for a Trump health care plan that would have stripped away important pre-existing condition of our protections, including potentially taking away the Affordable Care Act's coverage for transgender health care. She was the only Orange County Republican to vote for the tax plan, that the new tax law, that it was a giveaway to huge corporations and a tiny handful of billionaires, and that tax plan pushes the cost down onto people in Orange County, people across California. My campaign has always had a number of LGBTQ staff members. People ask me how did I do that, and the answer is simple. I hired the best, most talented campaign professionals I could find. Time. Thank you. It has enabled people to speak out in ways that they never would have in the past. And I talked to a lot of resistors and protesters and ralliers who asked me, Amar, do you think our governing institutions, in the middle of all this chaos, do you think our democracy, do you think they will protect the dreamers like my campaign manager, Marcella. I said together. Yeah. And can we elect the first Latino Arab American in the Trump era and prove that Trump's America is not the real America and the real America is full of patriots in this room? I believe that together and only together we can. Thank you so much. This question. Okay, great. All right, so. All right. Anyway, I'm going to stand up. Here we go. So I'm going to stand up because I can't see you guys in the back and I want to be able to. But many of you know uh, me because I'm the closest one, I think, to West Hollywood, running against Steve Knight in California's 25th district. So this is an exciting opportunity for us because we're not only going to flip this district from red to blue, we're going to flip it from blue to pink, and we're going to flip one of the most anti-LGBT members of Congress who not only is himself a, uh, a, 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 an enemy of the work that we're trying to do, but his, has a long family history of it. His dad is the one who championed Prop 22 in the state of California. He is, uh, he, that, you know, of course that led to marriage equality eventually, so we can't say all was bad in that, but, <laughs> but ultimately, 
Um, we're going to flip it with the first bisexual woman to be elected from California. So when we talk about, the, the question was really about how, how does equity play a role in our campaign? And for me, the biggest thing is that we can't have true equality without equal representation. And I can't be a representative. I, I, I don't look like every single person in America. I never could. But what I can do is elevate the voices of people who have for too long been silenced because people in Washington, our representatives in Washington, are fighting for special interests, for big money, for their corporate donors, and for the, the Republican Party that has zero interest in helping real people, the real people from those communities. Uh, in my career, I was the executive director of PAC, People Assisting the Homeless. And we saw over and over again the underrepresentation and, and the, the disproportionate number of people who people of color, people from, from underrepresented communities who were homeless, who were experiencing homelessness. And you have to look at the social indicators of health, you have to look at every aspect of what does it mean to be representing communities that have not had a voice previously. And not only together we can, but together we will. Thank you. Carly? I'm going to take a page from Katie here to stand up, partly because my wife has accused me of being ADD, and I usually say, we well, might be right, but I don't have time to talk about it. Um, but, uh, listen, thank you so much for having all of us here. It's, it's a, a tremendous opportunity to be in front of you and share with you our goals and aspirations. Uh, my goal and my aspiration is to retire Dana Warbacher, Russia's favorite <laughs> First piece of legislation I will add my name to is the Equality Act. And that means that we can pass all the legislation we want to fight discrimination. But that is only half of the battle. The other half of the battle is changing people's heads and hearts. And it is more clear than ever that we have a long way to go. There's very few things that I like about Trump, but one thing he has done is expose the fact that we got a long way to go. We got a long way to go. There is so much hatred that has come up that we thought did not exist that is there. It's widespread. It denigrates all minorities. And as you stated so correctly, if we do not stand together, we will fall together. We must stand shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, and fight discrimination of any kind across the United States. And with you, we're committed to doing that, all of us. Me. I've been married 27 years, 28, uh, and I have, uh, we have four kids, all in their mid-20s, uh, so we, we were busy, they're all under, within five years of each other, uh, all live here in Southern California helping out with the, uh, the campaign. Uh, going against Dana Warbacher has been uh, a privilege in some ways, because he's such a horrible person, and, and he has such a big target on his back. And, and I think many of you are aware of what he just recently said that uh, uh, is pertinent to your community. The, the National Association of Realtors reached out to Dana Warbacher to get him to sign on and, and, and have under HUD a protected class, uh, LGBTQ folks being a protected class. And he refused. He refused, he actually made the statement that if people do not want to sell their homes to gays and lesbians, that's their right. Well, they need to It's not their right. It's actually against the law in 22 states in our country. It should be the law in the entire country. And most recently, you might have seen him on uh, Sasha Cohen's recent documentary uh, in support of kindergartens. Uh, there's, there's a lot of difference between Dana Warbach and myself when it becomes, comes to gun control and addressing gun violence. And, uh, the bottom line is Dana Warbacher has been out of touch with the constituents of the 48th district. And Katie mentioned earlier about you know, why are some of these people still in office? And I'll share with you very briefly why. Because there hasn't been strong candidates, well financed, who can educate voters who the true incumbent is 
and why there's a better choice. And I'm proud to be up here with all of these candidates because I know all of us are far better choices than the people that are currently in office. <laughs> Gil? Well, stand like everybody else. Good evening, everybody. I am Gil Cisneros, and I am running for Congress in the 39th Congressional District, which encompasses Northern Orange County, Eastern LA County, and we've got a little bit of San Bernardino. But first, I want to thank you all for, for your work and your getting out there, canvassing, uh, writing cards, making phone calls. We're going to need that support going on into the general, and I'm looking forward to having you all come and work for me and all these other candidates to help us push, help push all of us over the top. So thank you very much all for your for your hard work. And give yourself a round of applause. When I think about my life, uh, really, it, it's been about service, and that service has started with my family. My grandfathers were World War II veterans. My dad was a Vietnam veteran. And I joined the Navy out of high school because, for me, it, I wanted to follow in my family's footsteps, but it was also the best way for me to kind of move my life forward. Uh, nobody in my family had gone to college before. My mother didn't even graduate from high school. So I took, right after I graduated from high school, five days after high school graduation, I went to boot camp. But I was lucky in that I met a chief petty officer, a senior enlisted there in the Navy, who saw something in me that I didn't really see myself yet, and he recommended that I apply for this program. And what this program was, it was the Navy's Affirmative Action Program, trying to get more people of color into the officers. So being the, the good young sailor that I was, I applied for this program, I got accepted, and then I just basically went right back to school, except I was doing it in the Navy. We did math, science, and English, five days a week, six hours a day. That program showed me education, uh, and gave me opportunity for education that I never knew existed before, and it changed my life. It changed my life so much so that I had another life-changing moment back in 2010, and I actually won the California lottery. I knew the one thing that I wanted to do was to give kids that same opportunity for education that I had. So me and my wife started our foundation, the Gilbert and Jackie Cisneros Foundation, where we've been providing scholarships, college access programs, we give books to kindergartners, support math education programs in elementary schools to kids from underserved communities. And after the November election of Donald Trump, we knew that we needed to do something different, and I needed to get involved. Healthcare, immigration reform, education, protecting the diversity of the American family. Good friends of ours are a gay couple that adopted three young children, took them into a situation that was horrible, and now they're raising these three young kids to be their own and giving them a great life. And that's what we need to protect in this. We need to protect here in our country and in our state. We need to protect diversity. Time. Just one other quick thing, but we need to protect diversity, and that's why we work very hard reaching out to voters, uh, expanding our universe, and we increased the Latino vote, uh, the Latino's, uh, Latino vote came up, was up 245% in our district in the last year. <laughs> last well, thank you, Stonewall, for having us. What an amazing group of candidates we have, don't you think? Incredible. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to take that to house. Are you ready to take that to house? That's why we're all here. What's going on in our country right now can't be allowed to continue. And what's going to happen in November is either going to be a repudiation of the values we see in Washington or an affirmation of those values. And for me, my background professionally is as an environmental attorney. I've been involved in the clean energy industry. Our district that I'm running in represents 52 miles of coast. It's in southern Orange County, in North County, San Diego, and for the last 18 years, it's been represented by a guy named Daryl Issa. You've heard of him. You, you would not be surprised that I get that quite a bit. 
And how could somebody who doesn't even believe in the basic science of climate change represent a district with 52 miles of coastline? So what prompted me to want to run, among many things, is I'm sick to death of seeing an environmental protection agency administrator who doesn't believe in environmental protection. We yeah. need to stand up for clean air, clean water, and clean feet. But beyond all of that, I was raised in a country where we respect and appreciate people and treat others with dignity, regardless of their country of origin, their religion, their gender, or their gender identity. That's the America that I know. That's the America that my wife and I are raising our two children, ages six and four, in. And we worry every single day that our kids and kids all across this country are going to see this president as some sort of role model, and they're going to become like this president. When we see him on TV, we turn the channel and we turn the TV off all together. But wasn't it nice when we had a president who was a decent human being? Wasn't that a nice thing? We actually now, unfortunately, are the politics of division, of short term trying to divide on all the things that I just talked about. And what I know is that we're better than that. We're better than what we're seeing on TV. We're better uh, than fearing one another. For me personally, it's a very, very difficult thing to see because my grandparents were immigrants. On one side, you probably guess they were Jews from Eastern Europe. You'd be right about that with the last name Levin. But my grandpa and grandma, they worked really hard. My grandpa served in World War II. When they got back, they started a small business here in Los Angeles, but they could not use the last name Levin in the business because of anti-Semitism in the 1940s and 1950s. So when you see the name Levin on a sign or a shirt, a banner, or a button, Think of my grandfather and my grandmother. Only a couple of generations later, their grandson is not only able to use that name, but able to run with that family name. That's the type of progress that we need. On the other side of the family, the side that you would not guess, my grandparents were Mexican immigrants. My mom's parents came from Mexico. My, my, I'll tell you this really quick. My grandpa was only 11. My grandma was three. They were the dreamers of their time. When I see dreamers today, that speaks to me. We have to treat people with decency again and respect again. So when you come down to Orange County, when you help us turn Orange County blue, when you come down to San Diego to help me in the mark, know that you are helping make this country what it has always been, what it always will be, and that is a country where we respect and appreciate one another, period, end of story. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's the house. Thank you. So the 30 mile is, um, you know, when you think of Orange County and a good part of our district is in Orange County, you think of that orange curve, you know, that's what they're talking about. But it's changed. And right now, the 39th of the voter registration between Dems and Republicans is less than 1%. It's basically a third Democrat, a third Republican, and a third independent. Ed Morris, when I first got into this race, I was running against Ed Morris, the incumbent. But after a while, I think he eventually saw the writing on the wall. So this district had changed so much that he didn't really represent the values of the district anymore. And so he decided to retire. So now it's an open seat. And I'm running actually against his handpicked successor, Young Kim, who's basically nothing more than Ed Morris 2.0. But the diversity of this district, the, the demographics have changed so dramatically. It's a minority majority district with a large Latino and a large Asian population. And because that's changed so much, it's also, like I said, changed the voter registration. But it is actually within reach. Like Katie said at the beginning, we just never really had a good candidate, a good Democratic candidate, to go out there and to go up against Schwartz. He had it easy for 25 years. At that time, times have changed. And really what we're doing is we're just going out there and we're telling my story. We're telling the people what we're going to represent, that we want common sense gun legislation, that we want you know, education for all, that we're going to support Medicare for all, as well as you know, fix the uh, Affordable Care Act. And then we're going to go out there and really give the people with the, from the district, the people of California, the people of this country, they, what they want. Common sense gun legislation is, is a big issue. I mean, it's a very proud that I've been part of that movement since the beginning. And it's something that 90% of the country wants. But yet we can't pass it because of the leadership in the Congress. And that's going to change when we flip the House. We're going to go, we're going to pass common sense gun legislation, we're going to pass immigration reforms. Because that's what the American people want, and that's what we're going to give them. 
So that's what we're talking about, and that's how we're going to make it happen. So thank you very much. And if we do that, then we're going to win. And that's where you guys come in. You come in in terms of making sure that we have the resources, every single one of us has the resources we need, the human bodies, to go out, knock on doors, tell people what's, why, what's at stake, why this matters, and why their vote will count more in this election than probably any other election that they're going to vote in. So that's one part. The other part is, you know, we have a, a large group of people in our community, and I'm sure this is the case in the others as well, that don't necessarily identify strongly with one party or the other. Party or the other. And when we were canvassing, we found people who'd forgotten what party they were registered as. So we we know, though, that the, the message that resonates across the board is that people do not feel like their representatives are working for, for them. They feel like they don't, if you raise, if you ask people to raise their hands, if they have a real representative, somebody who's fighting for them, no one raises their hands. You guys have Adam Schiff. That's great. He's fighting for you. But people in our district have had someone over and over again who has put uh, put the, the values and the concerns of the people who are funding his campaign over the people that we believe. So what I believe is going to win, the message is going to win, isn't necessarily one issue or the other because people vote on different issues, right? But it's that I'm someone who understands these things because I grew up here. I have lived these issues. I know what it's like, and I'm going to fight for you in Congress. That's why we're not taking any corporate tax money so people know who we're accountable to, and that it's a who we're going to be fighting for. So I think I think that's the resonating message that we need to get across is that we as Democrats are the party of the people and that's what we're going to fight for. This next one will start off with Ms. Porter. As we all know, even if the Democratic Party doesn't have control of the House in November, the Republican Party will still likely have control of the U.S. Senate and the White House, making for a very challenging environment. What are some of the top priorities in your first term as a member of Congress? And how can the Democratic Party most effectively advocate for progressive objectives in this context? So I think the path to both winning these seats and affecting change when we get there is to really explain to people what is at stake in this election. Um, and to not be afraid to take a strong stand on what you believe and recognize that other people in our communities feel strongly about some of these same issues. My day one priority is gun violence prevention. This is a huge issue. It affects all of us. It doesn't affect all of us equally. As we know, I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I am so grateful that my abuser did not possess a weapon. Um, I think that's an issue we need to keep working on, so I strongly support day one legislation on that. And by the way, that is a district in which we won Republican voters in Orange County. So just as someone said, 90% of people support gun violence prevention legislation, and we have waited too long. We cannot afford to let more people die, um, whether through suicide or a mass shooting, because we failed to act. Mimi Walters has an A-plus rating from the NRA, and she bragged about it right up until I won the primary, and that tweet just disappeared. <laughs> so that's a huge priority. Another big issue for my work as a consumer protection advocate is tackling housing discrimination. Um, this is a huge issue that affects the LGBTQ plus community. It also really affects mothers, single mothers with children. Turns out children are noisy and people don't want to live with them. Um, and so working to make sure that our um, Department of Justice and our HUD department are enforcing housing discrimination, um, both in the mortgage market and the rental market, is another top priority. So I'll start with those two and then I'll try again. Anyone else want to chime in on that real quick? We have a few minutes. So um, I think that the way we're going to win this campaign is the same way we're going to legislate, like she said, by leading with our values. I'm also not taking any corporate PAC money at all because the only special interest I would be beholden to is you. 
So, while Nuffy Hunter, who by the way inherited his seat from his dad and changed his name to make himself be Duncan Hunter Sr., because his name's actually Dwayne. Um, and my name's a Mark Hamp in the jar. Between he and I, you would think I would be the one to change my name and shorten it, but it was not. So, he inherited his seat from his dad, he sells his votes to the highest bidder, he said on TV that this tax plan that he voted for was going to hurt California, but he said it doesn't matter because California's stupid. No, sir, you're the congressman from California. It's pretty stupid to say that in this district. So people are hurting in my district. And I tell them, look, I don't care about your personal politics. When we talk, I care about your personal health. I care about your personal safety. I care about your personal financial dignity. And in my race, I gotta win some independents and some Republicans, like Republican women who are disaffected by, by Trump and Hunter. But the way we're gonna do it is by talking about what we believe in. Civility, dignity, not the divisiveness in Washington. And, and helping people where, what keeps them up at night. I talk to people who tell me, I have to decide if I get a gallon of gas or a gallon of milk tomorrow. I'm an illness away from losing my home. I talked to a veteran who told me he had to sell his medals to get his medicine next month. Heartbreaking stuff. And it's happening in Trump's America. And he talks about the stock market doing well, but he doesn't think about the real economy where people really live. And when I was at the Department of Labor, my last day there, I wrote Donald Trump a memo, which he doesn't read, so he probably didn't, didn't read it. But I said, President Trump, and I vomited. There's a program called, that sounds like your TV show, it's called Apprenticeship. It's a great marketing opportunity for you. Why don't you double down on this and do what you always do? Just put your name on something that already exists and take credit for it. And then he increased money from 90 million to, to 5 million, which is probably not because of me, but he wants to put 5 million people back to work. I want to invest billions of dollars because if you do that, then the strain on affordable housing and healthcare and education becomes less strenuous. The average apprentice makes $70,000 a year, double the median income in America. It's not sexy, but it'll put America back to work again and lift up a lot of lives. Time. Thank you. Thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick. All of us up here have been asked if what legislation we're going to submit when we first get to Congress. And we have to be honest that the idea of a freshman member of Congress submitting legislation typically isn't how it works. But what we can do, we've all been supported and endorsed by Democratic leaders, many from the state of California, that also represents in some ways the leadership of the Democratic caucus in the House. And with working with those individuals, we have the ability to make a difference by signing on to legislation and helping out. But more importantly than that, as a member of Congress, everywhere we go, we have a microphone and a podium. And we have an obligation through leadership to educate those that we talk to about the important issues facing us and how we can make a difference by supporting solutions that make sense for Americans in addressing those issues. So while we may be freshmen members of Congress, we will make a difference. Thank you so much. I'm going to address this question to Mr. Levin. There are a variety of solutions that have been proposed to expand access to high quality, affordable health care, including Medicare for all and Medicare Plus. And within California, there have been proposals for a single payer system and expansion of Medi-Cal to higher income levels. How do we move forward in the near term? Well, uh, like I think several of you on stage, uh, I have supported H.R. 676 at the federal level, which is the federal single payer bill. And I think a lot of us are going to be on to that if we get there. I uh, also supported uh, California's uh, equivalent SB 562. Uh, the reality is that uh, the Republicans have done nothing but attack uh, quality health care, access, cost, uh, since they've been in office. Uh, and now they're, you know, they failed to do it through the uh, American Health Care Act legislatively. It was actually the one-year anniversary. Everybody see that? One year ago. And so I tweeted out the video of all of them celebrating in front of the White House in the Rose Garden, where they were all applauding each other for uh, removing quality and affordable health care for millions and millions of Americans. They were unsuccessful because ultimately John McCain gave Donald Trump one of those. Everybody remembers that. Now they're trying to do it uh, through the legal system. They're trying to make it uh, so that if you've got a pre-existing condition, 
uh, the insurance companies can jack the premiums up. And all you have to do is see is where they're getting their campaigns funded from. Big insurance companies and big drug companies. I think one of the cool things about all of us here on stage is that none of us took corporate PAC contributions, I think. And that's probably one reason why we all won our races is because we refused to take corporate PAC contributions. In the case of our campaign, we've had about 100,000 donors that have each given on average about 25 bucks. So when I go to Washington, Knockwood, we'll all get there. And when I'm confronted with those big drug companies, those big insurance companies, we can stand up to them. There was a gentleman the other day who flew all the way from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, on behalf of the big insurance companies, just to sit down with me in our office for about 20 or 30 minutes. And he wanted to say that Medicare for all couldn't work, and that it was all pie in the sky, it would lead to less innovation, et cetera, et cetera. We, we took his information, we looked at him, and we said, did you really fly all the way here just to tell us that? Because we're, we're sorry to disappoint you, but you're gonna have to go and try to find some other member or aspiring member of Congress to convince of this nonsense. So we've got to stand up for quality and affordable health care for everybody, period, full stop. But we have to remind the American public and under the Republicans, their health care costs are going up, their access is going down, and enough is enough. Um, and I think continuing to speak out. With these arguments about religious liberty are not new. We saw them in the civil rights movement. We've seen them in other contexts. Um, and they've been rejected by the court. So I think um, this is a challenging time. It's challenging for Congress people and the House um, to directly influence the court. But there's a number of things that the Supreme Court will rule on that Congress actually can overturn. Um, there are statutory interpretation questions um, for example, whether the term um, sex includes gender identity, which it does. Um, we should make that clear by specifying gender identity in that host of civil rights um, statutes. But in the meantime, I think signaling right now that we're going to stand with the LGBTQ plus community and sign on to the Equality Act is one of the most important things we can do. Really quick, I think it can be easy for us to get discouraged because of the Supreme Court and, and what it looks like moving forward. But we have to remember that we have so many opportunities for legislative fixes that do, it doesn't matter who's on the Supreme Court. But one of the things that we can do is uh, is support legislation like the, custom, uh, the Customer Non-Discrimination Act, which would effectively make sure that no one, who whatever shop you're going to, whatever you're trying to do, whether it's a wedding cake or anything else, that, that the, 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 per, the proprietor can't discriminate against you, no matter your, your gender, your race, your, your identification, anything like that. So um, I think we can take some steps immediately, but the truth is it's going to be about our voice and about what we stand for and a repudiation of the hateful policies that are coming out of this administration and the rollbacks of our rights and our protections and our civil liberties uh, that are at risk in the Supreme Court. So I know we can do it, but it's gonna, it's gonna take all of us. Can each of you tell us what we can do to help from the out from the outside of the district to be most effective? How can we support it, such as voter registration, etc.? Um, should we just start again, Amar, and we can work our way this way? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll be honest with you. If it weren't for activists, I wouldn't be here right now. I would have lost my race. Point blank. We were having a lot of people attack us from the left and the right. If you were paying attention, it was a pretty absurd primary for me. But we made it through because I had a single weapon. It was all of you. Um, and so I need the help again. I need you to knock on doors. If you can't knock on doors because you want to stay here, make phone calls and help me multiply our message. I know it's a winning message. People are tired of the same old, same old. Duncan Hunter and his father have been there for 40 years, half a century. And the unemployment rate in my district is double the rest of San Diego. There's something going on. There's, there's a problem. He's attacking transgenders in the military. People who have fought for our independence, the very least we could do is return the favor and fight for theirs. He's attacked dreamers, he's attacked a lot of people. And he's, he's walked away from the working class, supporting this president when it comes to tariffs and everything else. So what we do need is a lot of financial support. People ask me, do you have the funds to, to win this race and to get out there? And I say, yeah, I do, it's just in your wallets and you gotta bring them out. So I need your help, I need your financial support, I need your devotion, I need your donations, I need your labor, I need your love, I need your hard work. 
I'm telling you right now, this is a seat that we could flip. It's an R plus 11 Hi. seat, but so was Pennsylvania and so was Alabama. We could flip Alabama, we could flip it. which is to come to coastal San Diego, Del Mar, Carlsbad, Oceanside, or South Orange County, San Clemente, beautiful places. You can come, you can knock on a couple of doors for a weekend, make some phone calls, go get lunch, enjoy yourself. It's a great way to spend a weekend. We've had a ton of people come down from LA down to North County, San Diego. I can tell you we have three offices in San Clemente, Oceanside, and Solana Beach. It's a really beautiful place if you're going to go campus somewhere. And every single one of those doors you knock, every single one of those calls you make will make a difference. I can tell you that in the primary, 51.5% of the voters voted Democratic, which is pretty incredible. All we have to do is continue that momentum, continue to mobilize that grassroots Democratic support, and ensure our folks turn out. And we've got to get some declining states to come our way as, as well, which I think Hi. we can. If we do that, we win, but I need your help. So some of you may know this, maybe not, but in the 48th district, in the primary, in 2014 midterm, there was about 95,000 votes casted. In this one, there were 175,000 votes casted. And as you know, the top two advanced and I got the second seat by 125 votes out of 175,000. So, if somebody asks me, does every dollar raised, door knock, phone call made, social media tweet matter? Hell yes, it matters. And, and thanks to you guys and many folks like you, I'm standing here because of your support. Grassroots support is what it's all about. Yesterday we had a grassroots get together, over a thousand people turned out, we had actually had on a football team to dominate them. We've got to get folks registered. That's a key piece of this. There's a lot of 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, and 20-year-olds and disenfranchised individuals that need your help in getting registered. There's lots of great organizations out there. If you have questions or don't know where to turn to, I suggest you turn to the leader of your Democratic club. And if that doesn't help, you can call me or email me, Harley at HarleyForCongress.com. Thanks. I'll just repeat the offer to knock doors, text. I'll say that particularly in my race, um, I've been on stage with these folks many times before, um, and one of the things over the over the course of the year is, Mike says I'm, used to say, I'm running against Daryl Issa, and the crowd would go, uh, and Harley would say, I'm running against Russia's favorite congressman, Dana Rowe. And everyone would say, good, I would say, I'm running against Mimi Walters. And somebody in the back would say, why are you running against Maxine Waters? <laughs> in our district, our big challenge is educating people about who their congressman is and what she believes. Mimi Walters called gay marriage a travesty of family values. When asked by an 18-year-old gay man if she supported gay marriage, she said, that's your business, but don't expect any rights. So this is an extreme conservative, and we need your help to call her out as such. This is a woman-on-woman -woman race, which in a way is a celebration of incre increasing inclusivity. But let's face it, Mimi Walters, day in, day out, is voting against the interests of anybody who doesn't meet her hardcore right-wing ideology. Like Uncle Sam says, you know, I need you. 
I need you to come out. I need you to, to be part of our army, to go out there and knock on doors, to, to make the phone calls, and to really help us get the vote out like we did in the primary. We're going to do the same thing in the general. And if you want to make a donation, CisnerosForCongress.com, you can do that as well. It's already been said, but we really do need people. And I'm looking across this room and I see so many of you who are, I'm standing here because of you. You helped us with the primary, you helped us to really defy the odds to be someone who had more resources than we did coming out the gate and, and who was seen originally as the shoe in for this, for the Democratic nomination. So I really, that's how we did it, right? We had literally over a thousand volunteers in the primary. Uh, that number has more than doubled already since we got to the general. And every single weekend, almost every single day, we're kicking off events to have people knock on doors. Because like I said earlier, it's about turnout. If we get Democrats to turn out to vote, then we're going to win in almost every single one of these seats. And you know, just a few need a break from the United state side. Um, so what that takes, though, is we're talking about people who have never voted in off-year elections. We're talking about people who don't normally even get contact from anyone who's running because they're low propensity voters. So the way that we move those voters is by having these face-to-face -face conversations. That means that we need you to drive up or drive down to our districts. That means that every single dollar is gonna to go to critical voter education and, and voter communications. And we're all up against Hood Brothers money. I think that we, every single one of us has had massive investments already in our districts by the Republican Party and by uh, people like the Hood Brothers to try and beat us. So it's, this is, the Democrats have the winning ideals and we have the, the moral imperative at this point that we can't, we, it's not just gonna be nice if we win, it's not just gonna be nice if we take back Congress. We have to win. We have no choice to win. And the only way we do that is if every single person who believes that we have to make this happen does absolutely everything we can. And I ask you, for all of us, to, before you leave today, to say, to see if you really are doing everything that you can, and if not, do a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. We actually have one question for you specifically. Yeah. So, though California has been described as a beacon for the progressive movement, we have very significant challenges in our own backyard. How do you, as a congressperson, address local issues such as homelessness, right? Access to medical care, living wages, housing shortages, up there. <laughs> yeah, can I look at you a minute? Sure. I'll do my best. Okay. So, uh, homelessness, as you know, is my background in affordable housing, healthcare. I worked on the Medicaid expansion uh, to bring healthcare to literally millions of Californians. And the only way that any of that is possible at the local level is if we have the right federal partners in place. Um, so, we have Prop HHH you mentioned, which we passed to address homelessness in the city and county of Los Angeles. But the success of those programs is dependent on us being able to actually make federal legislation that goes alongside that. So when we passed Prop HHH, we were counting on federal funds that are that have basically been demolished because the low income housing tax credit program has been demolished by the Republican tax plan. Uh, that means that every dollar is going to, to go less far for us to have an impact on the issue right here. We need to make sure that we are having those investments in the housing choice voucher programs that are at risk of being cut now with this administration. Um, healthcare, the same thing. What we've done in California, if we don't have support at the national level, is, is not going to be able to have the impact that we need to. So we need people who understand these policies, who have expertise in some of the toughest issues facing our communities across the state of California, to take a leadership role and say, what can the federal government do? What do we need to do to work with our state and local partners to actually make difference here? Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to chime in on that? Because I have one other question. I'll, I'll jump in on that. It, it's a large question, so I'm it just going to handle the medical, the medical part. You know, my um, my father had worked with this company for 25 years. They let to go. And when that happened, my family lost some insurance. He used to have to go down to Tijuana to go buy his diabetes medication because it was just too expensive to buy in the United States. My mother went 16 years without health insurance. That shouldn't happen in this country. It's too rich of a nation to have that. And that's why we need to make sure that everybody has access to good quality, affordable health care. I talked to a mother who her eight-year-old daughter was born with a heart attack. They've already spent a half a million dollars 
on our health care. And now they're talking about taking away the pre-existing conditions, which that heart defect is going to be part of that pre-existing condition. We need to protect our families like that. The government is out there to protect individuals that need help and they need support. And right now, our federal government is not doing that. So when we go to Washington, I know all of us are going to work to ensure that we take care of the less fortunate, to make sure that everybody pitches in and does their fair share. Thank you. Can I just add one quick thing? I think we need to recognize these issues are interrelated. Whether we are talking about homelessness, affordable housing, uh, universal health care, infrastructure, they are all interrelated. And the dry underlying aspect that's driving the issues in all of these is the declining middle class. We need to rebuild livable wages in our country, make sure unions are in the forefront of being able to have collective bargaining and, and, and help make sure that livable wages and the growing middle class is addressed. Three individuals in our country have wealth equivalent to the bottom 50% of Americans. We're going the wrong direction. And if we don't change it, these issues are going to remain. Anything we do is just going to be band-aids on it. Okay, would each of you sign a pledge in support of deployment veterans? Yes? Already have. Sure. <laughs> 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 yeah. all, all of you do. Okay, great. You just... Can you speak to Mr. Lee before you leave? <laughs> also, um, referring to how we can support each of your districts, do you have signage or sign ups? for folks who are here today in the back of the room or with you so they can see you and see how they can support each of you. Do you? Each of you, yes? Yeah. And if, if not, it's super easy online. Everything, all of our events are online on our, we, our, our Facebook, our Facebook, our website, uh, everything like that. <coughs> okay, so maybe you can come and speak with them after. See how they're in the back. So turn around. Up for me. They're all on the way. Right. 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 Okay. Also, you can check our website. We have stickers and name tags and everything representing excellent. Okay, let's wrap it up here because I think we're time, right? Okay. Um, okay, well I would like to thank all of you for joining us tonight. How was that?